Dear Lord, as always, I thank you for the opportunity you've been able to bring your word this morning. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive the seed of your word. And I pray that it would speak truth to us. Your word is spirit. Your word is truth. And I pray, Lord, that you would seed something in us that can grow and can bless and benefit the communities around us. Any error is mine. All glory and all honour is yours. Amen. Okay, so I've called this message Balance Point. Uh, Balance Point. For reasons that will hopefully come clear in the, in, the, in the message itself. But as you've just had illustrated very briefly by Grace. Grace is in the middle. And there are elements that pull either side. But Grace is in the middle. Anyway, last week we looked at something that I called the the, the age to come. And during this, I took a look at how we ought to live on this planet and what the Christian hope actually offers us. And the Apostle Paul gives us that really clear pointer for this in his letter to that church in Corinth. It's a great piece of writing and it makes very clear what the Christian hope is. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And after that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler, authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scripture says, God has put all things under his authority. Of course, when it says all things are under his authority, that does not include God himself who gave Christ his authority. Then when all things are under his authority, the son will put himself under God's authority so that God who gave his son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. Amazing piece of writing. All things will be put under his authority. And as we read last week in Revelation, one day God will be the all in all in the centre of humanity. Paul never taught about a far off place. He never taught about a far-off place, but he lived in the hope that one day he too would be resurrected. And from when he left planet Earth until that time of resurrection, he would be found in Christ. In Christ. Our hope is that one day we will be resurrected to inhabit new and gloriously transformed bodies, living on a revitalised, and a rejuvenated planet where God once again dwells in the centre of humanity. What an amazing place. What an amazing place. If you were to actually pause and just think of this incredible, beautiful planet that we live on, just pause and think about that just for a moment. This planet, which is flawed, which is broken, which is groaning, but contained within it, I believe, are hints of the age to come. The incredible intricacy of those tiniest, tiniest little insects, the flora, the fauna, and each of those interconnecting with the other to produce the whole. The array of birds, the differing plumage, the beautiful sounds of their songs... The diversity of animal life from the smallest tiny little rodents in our kitchen. From the smallest tiny little rodents to the majestic beasts that roam the African plains. Amazing. You think about the sea life. The sea life and all that it contains. From the corals to the whales and everything in between. It is staggering. It is staggering. It is beautiful. Absolutely amazing. We should be recognising the beauty of all of this. It's staggering. When God made all this, he declared it was good. I accept that was the original creation for the fall of man. But there are hints. There are hints. This world still contains hints. 
pointers to what will come. They signpost what God is going to do in the future, I believe. This is another reason why we shouldn't worship creation. Creation acts just as a signpost. It acts as a signpost to the creator. And that's where the focus of our worship should lie. But creation is significant because not only does it sustain us here and now, it's also there for us to care for and it's there for us to steward. And it's there for us to do all of those things as we track towards this new reality that God will one day usher in. And within this in-between period, we live on a planet and we move in societies that are, how can I say, shaky at best, um, wobbly at other times. But all of this plays out in quite, I suppose, quite simple terms and perhaps quite stark terms. We live in a state of chaos and order. You saw how difficult it was for Grace just to keep her balance between opposites. We live in a state of chaos and order. And in these terms that I've got here, chaos. Chaos is things that you can't predict, things that you can't understand. Chaos. Order. Things that you can predict, things that you can understand. Order. Now, too much time spent in either of those camps can be really problematic, believe it or not. If you live in a place where there is too much order, it basically becomes a place of tyranny. It becomes a tyrannical state. Too much order. It's often cold, it's clinical, it lacks warmth, and in some respects it also lacks personality. I know that over the years I've walked into houses where everything is just so. Everything is just absolutely perfect. Everything is in exactly the right order. And in those places, you can't ever put your feet up. You cannot relax. You really can't relax. I remember going to houses with my kids when they were all little in certain houses, which I won't name, uh, and you'd be like a cat on a hot tin roof. You really would. Be, ooh, 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 watching the kids, making sure that you were ready to bounce up and grab something and catch something that the kids were likely to drop before it hit that plush carpet that had been groomed in just the right direction. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> It was an absolute nightmare, absolute nightmare. Not a relaxing place for me to be. It becomes almost tyrannical, too much order. Then there are those places where you walk into, which is absolute chaos. Absolute chaos, anarchic chaos. And when I was sort of thinking about that, I was thinking of my daughter as a teenager and her bedroom. And her bedroom was dreadful. You'd open the door and chaos reigned. Chaos absolutely reigned. There was a sense when you opened her door and looked in at her room that nothing could be done. Absolutely nothing could be done at all. It was too much to look at. It was too much to deal with. And so what I do is I just back out the door and I close the door. Just close the door, walk away, keep chaos at bay. Have we, we've all probably had children like that somewhere. Maybe we have been those people. Maybe we still are. Anyway. But when you think about it, that's what we do is we shut the door. Shut the door on chaos. Just push it away. You got one of those cupboards at home? Where you, you, if you open the door of the cupboard, everything will come tumbling out of you? I know we do. I know we do. But if you think of, think of what we do in life, if you think of chaos as, as nature, think of chaos as nature itself, what do we do? We build houses, right? We build houses to live in so that we can keep nature outside of the walls. We keep nature outside of the walls and we erect all around us. We put up our, around our sections, don't we? We put up fences. And we do that to keep the chaos out of my section. We put gates on, we put bolts on, we lock all of this stuff up. And back in the day, cities would be walled. And they'd be walled because to prevent nature, to prevent nature, that chaos from creeping into the city and taking it over. It's the attempt of humanity to live within two points, to strive for order amongst a world of chaos. So we're striving for order amongst a world of chaos. And this is the world that we inhabit during this in-between period, waiting for Jesus to return. Tension, tension. And while we wait, we need to walk a pathway. We need to find our balance. 
and we need to live a life that has got both meaning and purpose. Grace couldn't stand on that square when she was pulled between those opposite forces. She couldn't stand there. And it wasn't a comfortable place for her. So how do we do that in life? Because this is the life that we live in, right? Where we're pulled with these different points of tension between chaos and order. How on earth do we do that? And how do we do that habitually, i.e. all the time? I'm sure that many of you will have seen this, um, uh, this little circle. And what this little circle represents is yin and yang. This is an incredibly old concept, predates Christianity, and it basically derives from Chinese philosophical thought. And it puts in a very simple picture form, a concept that describes how opposites or contrary forces actually may be complementary to each other, interconnected, interdependent, and how they then give rise to each other as they interrelate to one another. So I was looking at this, thinking about this concept, and and if you consider one part of that image as chaos and the other part as order, you can also see a small little dot in chaos and a small little dot in order. Well, in chaos, you have a small dot of order, and in order, you have a small dot of chaos, right? And these two small dots within the symbol represented up there, I'm going to call hope and warning. Hope and warning. You see that the hope is that chaos can be influenced by order and the warning is that order can be overtaken by chaos. Do you get that? The hope is that chaos can be influenced by order and the warning is that order can be overtaken by chaos. Because either encroachment as we've already heard from people's houses and my daughter's bedroom, can be problematic. So our goal then is to straddle the reality of our living in a way that makes sense of life and also allows us to balance our living in a way that no one area consumes the other. How on earth do we do that? How do we live a life in a world that has these competing forces at play and stay grounded? How do we do that? So, we started off with a bit of Chinese ancient philosophy. Now let's have a look at Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, in the first of his first of his noble truths, noted that life is suffering. Well, he didn't speak English, so suffering is is the from the Pali tongue, which is a, a variation of Sanskrit, which is dukkha. Life is dukkha, dukkha. And dukkha incorporates anything which is temporary, including happiness. Anything that's temporary. It includes dissatisfaction, stress, or it includes dependence on or affected by something. So life is dukkha. For simplicity's sake, then, if life is nothing more than suffering, dissatisfaction and stress, well, we're actually engaged in a battle that we can never win. We're engaged in a battle that we can never win. And if we're engaged in a battle that we can never win, then the whole of life can spiral into a cesspit of meaninglessness, a life devoid of hope. Mm -hmm. So, in his book, Human, All Too Human, the German atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, in reality, hope is the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torments of man. He was a great bloke to go out with and have a drink with on a Friday night, I can tell you. Old Nietzsche. This is the sort of chap that you want to get alongside when you're feeling a bit blue. Goodness me, really. But with this philosophy then, what we can do is we can easily spiral into that area of chaos where we can no longer predict or even understand what on earth is going on around us. If you just look around the world at the moment, just look around the world at the moment. We have had over the past two years of this virus running around the world. Two years plus now. Morphing, changing, outstripping medical science with the speed that the mutations are taking place. Not to mention all of the mixed reactions uh, concerning the medical and governmental responses to it. We've got Europe 
that's engaged in a war, East versus West, a clash of competing ideologies, with that European landmass once again being the scene of conflict. And let's be clear, right? When European nations go to war, it has the potential to impact every other nation on Earth. Let's be very clear about that. If the First and Second World War don't give us a strong reminder of that and cause us to remember, then we're destined to repeat those huge failures of humanity. We have the world's financial system being affected with high inflation, rising interest rates, food costs going through the roof. When people can't afford to buy food and eat, the simple equation is they die. There you go. We have the potential of fuel shortages, food shortages, shortages of building supplies, shortages of both mechanical and electrical goods, just to name a few. Just to name a few of the shortages that we may be facing in the future. And you know what? When we have those shortages, what happens? We have the collapse of businesses. We have the collapse of income for many, which in turn then sees the rise of social unrest on a scale and at a level that this generation will never have experienced. Things spiral. The chaos begins to manifest and it becomes the predominant force. And with all of that, hope is lost. And as we look around us, we're face to face with many folk who live their days. Their absolute days are filled and devoid of hope. They stagger from crisis to crisis. Some folk manage to navigate their way through this and, and face the things that scare them witless. And, and when they do, invariably, they'll exit stronger than they went in. But many folk today weigh heavy with mental and emotional health issues that stem from a lack of sense of meaning, a lack of purpose. And none of this is new to humanity, you know. None of this is actually new to humanity. I think we just hear about more often because we're so interconnected. So the speed of connection regarding news. But for generations and generations, the ancient people, the ancient people, those real people, those real human beings, you know, there were real human beings before us on this planet, those real human beings back in times long past as they walked this earth, well, they knew all of this. And they captured their thoughts, but they captured their thoughts in pictures predominantly. I'm sure you will be aware of many of these pictures. I mean, think about St. George and the Dragon, right? St. George and the Dragon, that brave knight who sallies out from behind the city walls to, to attack a dragon who's demanding human sacrifice and to rescue fair damsel in distress. Da, da, da. And the artwork to create such images is really worthy of note because there's an underlying narrative behind that artwork that goes back for centuries and centuries and centuries in terms of the message that this conveys in the picture thinking. Because every aspect of those pictures speaks to an aspect of our psyche, our fears, our hopelessness. Are you aware of that? Are you aware that St George and the Dragon speaks of that? The city of St George is ensconced, is surrounded by walls. The walls are there to act as a natural barrier to keep things out, to keep nature or chaos from overspilling into the order of the city itself. The dragon is that thing to be feared. You know, the thing that doesn't actually exist in actuality. A dragon doesn't actually exist, but it's manifest however our mind decides to shape it. And the dragon brings chaos to the order of our lives, smashing against the walls that we put up, looking for weak spots. But sometimes, if we, if we were to ride out and face that dragon, if we were to ride out and face that fear, if we were then successful in defeating it, we find that along with overcoming whatever that particular fear represents, we'll also find something very precious. And why will we do that? Because a dragon always lays on a hoard of gold. There is always gold, there is always treasure in the lair of the dragon which means that buried under the dark, dark things that terrify us, there will always be things of value that we can then apportion to our lives and build into us. You know, stories like this, countless others in the pantheon of myth and legend all speak with truth. Small t, truth. They all speak with truth. And each of them encourages, encourages the viewer of that picture or the reader of that script to take a position to stand at that 
cross-section between chaos and order, to act as a mediator between the two in order to bring balance, to find meaning and to find purpose, and then to produce harmony. We saw how difficult it was for grace to stand. That doesn't mean that place that you stand in the centre there is always going to be a happy place. It doesn't mean that. Despite what secular society is going to tell you that, you know, it's all about being happy. The meaning of life isn't about happiness. The meaning of life is not about happiness. The meaning of life is about choice. Choices. And on that crossbar of life, we have the choice to go left or we have the choice to go right or to centre ourselves and stay balanced. The problem is we're human, right? And we really find it difficult to maintain that fine balance. And we tend to tilt one way when we're pulled, or we tend to tilt the other way when we're pulled. Driven mostly by our own ego and desires, probably. But we do. We are pulled off balance all the time. Too much order, and we end up with a totalitarian tyranny. Too much chaos, and we see the breakdown of all the structures and the boundaries that we need to live by. Oh, if only there was someone who could straddle that cross-section and act as the perfect mediator between chaos and order. If only there was someone who could balance that cross-section perfectly and bring about a sweet spot, a place of harmony, a place where meaning and purpose can perfectly coalesce. If only. Ah. Enter the Apostle Paul as he writes to Timothy, that young pastor. Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6, says this. For, is there, for there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. There is one mediator. This is the Greek word, uh, mesites. And this doesn't mean that Jesus was the one looking to negotiate or bargain like a mediator would do in, in our understanding of the word. This means that he was the only one who was able to go between man and God in order to enable them to have relationship. He was the only one. And in those terms, and in that understanding... It would be entirely on God's terms, not a negotiation. He could stand there entirely on God's terms. Terms set by God and terms that only God could pay. Because as verse 6 tells us, he gave his life to purchase freedom. He stepped into that point of chaos to bring order. And now order has been achieved in him. Because he is the only one who is able to straddle that central point and maintain that balance. And scripture says all of that came just at the right time. And I consider this and I think, yep, that was just at the right time. Because, you know, God, I am sure, had met with humans over the course of history up to that point. Through his nation, Israel, obviously, through the prophets, obviously. But I've also got no doubt, you know, that God met with people through the rituals of what we would call other pagan religious beliefs. I've got no doubt that God has met with people. Now, some may wriggle in their seats a little bit and feel a little bit uncomfortable when I say things like that. Uh, did you hear what he said? He's, he's, he's promoting pagan beliefs. Well, if that's what you heard, I would strongly urge you to get your ears checked or to change the batteries in your hearing aids. That's not what I said. All roads do not lead to God. But I do believe that Jesus will intersect and walk any road to introduce himself. So what are you doing? Sorry. He did exactly that with me. He did exactly that with me. My road was way off track from anything godlike or Christ-like. <laughs> no way. And he met me there, exactly where I was right where I was. And he offered me another pathway for living. He found me in the middle of chaos. And he can find you in the middle of chaos. 
Whatever your chaos is, your chaos will be different to my chaos. But no matter where you are, he can and he will find you. It's a bit like that film Taken, isn't it? With Liam Neeson in it. I have a very particular set of skills. I will find you and I will kill you. And that's exactly what Jesus does, you know. He has a very particular set of skills. Tracking and hunting down those who are lost and in chaos. And when he finds them, he kills them. He kills their desire to live against him. He kills their love of self. He kills their jealousies. He kills their anger. He kills their bitterness. And he replaces it all with himself in the form of his spirit. Christianity is all about the death of self, killing self. And becoming, as C.S. Lewis would put it, little Christs. We become little Christs. But let's get back to those pagans. Because you can't have church without some good pagans thrown into good measure, can you? You can't. So the pagans, the pagan belief, their beliefs, however imperfect those humans, those pagan humans understood the things that they saw, they often recorded them in picture form. And ultimately, in the fullness of time, at just the right time, God, in the person of Jesus, stepped into time to reveal who he actually is. And if you think about the ancient creation myth of Mesopotamia, it's, it's in, captured in something called the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish, which is also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, where the creation of the world was described as having come about when the god Marduk overcame chaos and all that entailed. I'd encourage you to read it. The Enuma Elish, you find it online. Read it with one eye on the account of Genesis. So read them alongside each other. Now, some may posit that Genesis came first in terms of uh, literature and that other ancient documents are nothing more than the deviation from Genesis, but I personally am not sure that that's the case. If we accept that Genesis was written down by the hand of Moses, as is traditionally taught, Moses wasn't around until about 1,400 years before Christ, and this type of creation narrative uh, tracks way back to the ancient period of Sumerian culture, which ran from about 4,000 years before Christ to about 1,750 years before Christ. Stories like the fall of man or this great flood narrative, they've been recorded in Sumerian history way before Abraham ever rocked up on the scene. And, and remember, before Abraham was, there were no Hebrews. There were no Hebrews before Abraham. Abraham lived around 2,000 years before Christ. And Abraham was chosen by God to leave Ur of the Chaldees, where God would then make of him a nation. Not a family, but a nation. And that nation would ultimately be made up of a people known as Hebrews, which would in turn give rise to the nation state of Israel and the Jewish tradition. And if you were to just look at that timeline from the Sumerian time to, to Abraham, to Moses, who wrote Genesis, and you were to look at that crossover period when Abraham was called, Back in Ur, Abraham would have been well aware of, of all of the myths that underpinned the society that he had been raised in. They were focused, those myths were focused on worshipping creation, focusing on worshipping moon, sun, stars, seasons, not the God who sits above them. These ancient narratives of creation, of flood, were then subsequently translated later modified in order to suit the Babylonian culture, then reworked by the Assyrians. And I think it is more than possible that the earliest writers of Jewish history, Moses onwards, took the basis of this story, wove their strands into the tapestry, because those ancient tapestries contained truth with a small t. But the pagan focus was on creation, not the creator. So Moses, in Genesis, corrects the perspective. He lays out the scene. And as the story unfolds through the history of the Jewish people, more and more and more is then revealed about this God who stands above creation. Until eventually this progressive revelation, as I've termed it in previous teachings, unveils in a, a new name for God. And finally, we hit the climax, don't we, of that revelation. The climax of God's revelation, well, at least according to what I believe and what we as Christians profess, 
The climax is the revelation of God to humanity in the person of Jesus. The transition, the progressive revelation of the name until Jesus stands there and says, I have manifest your name. That's what it's about. And when Jesus steps into time, he says, hey, guys, this great God, this great God that you have been struggling to conceptualize and understand. So you've been worshiping suns, moons, stars, all of this sort of stuff. This great God that you've been struggling to understand, well, you can do that now. Because look, here I am. And I'm in a form that you can really get to grips with. Because I'm like you. You can walk with me. You can touch me. You can talk with me. You can laugh with me. You can eat with me. You can drink with me and you can cry with me. Well, I don't know about you, but I think that's all pretty amazing. So let's see if we can tease some of, something more of this out. I was listening to someone the other day um, talking about what the difference is between God and man. What's the difference between God and man? And the answer that they gave was limitation. Limitation is the difference. You see, if you think about three attributes of God, God is omniscient. He knows everything, all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He's omnipresent. He's in all things at once, all present. What God does not have is limitation. He's not limited. He has no limitation. Humanity, on the other hand, have got none of those three attributes of God, but they do have limitation. We have limitation. We're finite. We're not infinite. Without limitation for humans, there's actually no reality. Because it is the limitations that we live within that give us boundaries, that set us parameters. And those parameters are then established, and that's what we call reality. And actually, in this process, having set those limitations, those boundaries, those parameters, having set that reality, that's what then defines us as being human, human beings. So without those limitations, there is no being. And this brings with it inherent problems, doesn't it? Because with limitation brings suffering. Limitation brings with it suffering, which is a problem. Because without limitation, without suffering, there's no being. So by stepping into our time... And doing so in our mortal frame, God is now uniquely placed to be the one who mediates, who can bring the balance that only God can offer in that median place between the the churn of chaos, the tyranny of order. And this is something that only he could do because it would never have worked the other way around. And he did so to set us free, free from all that keeps us bound up and all that keeps us locked down. He has stepped into our limitations And he meets us exactly where we are. The theological term for this is kenosis, self-emptying. The Apostle Paul notes in Philippians 2, 6 to 11, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honour and gave him the name above all names, so that in the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so in accepting these limitations, he faced what limitations bring. And what does limitation bring? Suffering. And in order to free us from that place of slavery to suffering, there was a purchase price. Because there is always a purchase price for releasing someone from slavery. You wanted to buy a slave, you had to pay for them. There's always a purchase price for freedom, for liberty. And in this case, it cost his life. And he made that choice. And in doing so, he demonstrated himself as the perfect human being, the perfect mediator. He took upon himself a mode of being, 
human. And that enabled him to make real the claim that to be human in its fullest sense is actually worth the suffering. Because in him, as he drew all things above, all things below, all things within into himself, the limitations of life, the suffering of life, are now fused with meaning, purpose, with sense and fulfilment because they can now all be found in him. The Buddha, in the first of his noble truths, noted that life is suffering, dukkha. But that suffering has now been wrapped up in the life of Jesus Christ, who has shouldered and drawn into himself every, other, every single aspect of suffering, time past, present and future. And in doing so, he has won the ultimate victory through his suffering on the cross. He has won through suffering and he has emerged victorious. The yin and the yang, that delicate balance between chaos and order, has now found perfect balance, achieved through his life, his death and his resurrection. Because Jesus stepped into the limitations of our being in order to restore all things. And he now straddles the seesaw between chaos and order and he brings perfect balance. Friedrich Nietzsche said, hope is the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torments of man. But not when that hope is founded and grounded in the God who stepped into our world and now stands as the fundamental anchor point in our faith. Our hope is firm. Our hope is fixed in the God man who is the first fruits of the resurrected dead. And he has set the pattern of restoration and rejuvenation for everything that's going to come after him, for everything that is going to follow him. Hope. And that dragon, that dragon, that terrifying thing that represents all of our fears can now be faced. And the gold, the treasure that is hidden in its lair can be retrieved to enrich our lives when it is done so through the one who has now been elevated to the name above all names and the one to whom all things bow, including dragons. All things bow. We live in a world that is groaning for restoration, a world that is full of suffering, where people make the pursuit of happiness their goal, but they are shooting for the wrong star. The meaning of life is not about happiness. If you find happiness in your life, that's a bonus and thank God for it. The meaning of life is ultimately about choices. What do you choose? What response do you choose to whatever is thrown at you? What is your choice? And perhaps that response to what do you choose is directly linked to who do you choose? You see, life can be meaningful enough to justify its suffering if you choose the right who. The writer of the book of Hebrews notes this in Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, dis disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility endured from sinful people. And then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. We run with endurance that race, this life, that race, all of its obstacles, all of its challenges, all of its ups, all of its downs. And we do so by keeping our eyes fixed firmly on Jesus. Note that, on Jesus. He is the power, he is the authority of God on earth. He is the right hand of God. Nothing is hopeless. Nothing is futile and nothing is beyond the reach of this great God who stepped into our humanity, lived with our limitations and suffered in order to become the first fruits of all that is to follow. 
And when we face things voluntarily head on, we overcome. Because in him, we are overcomers. So can I just encourage you, no matter what you hear over coming weeks, months, even years, keep your eyes firmly fixed on the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And allow him to step into that central place of your world to bring balance between the chaos and order so that none of you get swept up with all of this nonsense that we are seeing unravelling around us in the world. And for us, his body, to reflect that same balance within our communities, in the way that we respond to the situations of the day, the way that we respond to the challenges of today, and how we can then demonstrate his kingdom on earth in contrast to those worldly powers. Bless you, church. Wear him well. Let's just pray. Lord, I thank you that you were worthy. You were worthy to strip yourself of every single divine privilege that you held. To step into our form and to live with our limitations. Which ultimately meant that you lived with our suffering but that in you, you have drawn everything, including suffering, into yourself through your suffering on the cross, that in your blood, we have life, we have balance, we have meaning, we have purpose, because everything, when centred on you, makes sense of everything that's going on around us, Lord. May we be a people who consistently, habitually, Keep you as the centre of our focus. And may we demonstrate that balance, that balance point to the world around us. Grace stands in the centre. And we thank you for the grace that you have given us. Go with your church, Lord. Bless your folk, I pray. Amen.